back. They are slavery's young victims, children on fishing boats, either scooping water out or diving to untangle net. Some of them die under the water and are abandoned to become feed for fish. This worrying situation is playing out on Ghana's Volta Lake, where an estimated 10,000 children work as slaves, sold by their own parents for pittance. They are part of the more than 1.9 million children aged between 5 and 17 said to be engaged in child labor in Ghana. That's the focus on Joy News' latest hotline documentary titled Slaves of the Volta. In the following clip, Kwete Nate speaks to a man who spent over 16 years working as a slave. I was young, so I, could, I don't have any right to say anything. Whether if you are sick, unless they see that, oh, you are sick. But if you are telling them that you are sick, they will just tell you you are lying. They will force you to go. And meanwhile, you don't have option. You have to go. And the one thing is living here. At that time, to wake up in at 12, uh, 8, 11 30 p.m., to go paddle up to 6 o'clock. Sometimes we used to blow, but you have to force them to go. What brought you here? Who gave you a way to come and work over here? Oh, before I would come here, it was my father who brought me here. And then I came to stay with my brother. And then during that time, I was schooling, but I couldn't go to school. I couldn't go to school. So uh, he said, you will bring me here so that if I grow small, you come and pick me. Yes. So, mm. uh, How much was given to your father before he made you come over here? Oh, no. He didn't, they didn't give him anything. Mm. He didn't give him anything. But because he's my brother and also working, and he don't have anybody to help him, you see, he brought me to come and help me. I didn't think in it. How many years did you spend over here? Yeah, I spent three years here. I spent three years here without seeing a lorry before. Mm. Yeah. What finally changed your mind and you were like, no, I have to leave this job and and go back to school. You see, as I'm growing, I begin to notice things. So one day my father came to this town and then he told me that uh, one of my brother is called James. He also had uh, a front priest. At that time today were also fishing. And then he told me that James is coming to school. And I said no. Yeah. And I said no. If James is coming to school here at our town, then me too, what am I sitting here waiting for? Because it's like we are like a twin brothers. So if I didn't see him, I'm not happy. So before they say he's coming to his schooling, and I said, no, I have to go. And then I told my father that if James is schooling, then me to have to go to school. So he said, if I said I want to go to school, he will take me back. So during Humawa festival, and then he asked my brother to bring me back mm -hmm. to come and start school. And then I told my father that if James is schooling, then me to have to go to school. So he said, if I said I want to go to school, he will take me back. 
So during Humawa festival, and then he asked my brother to bring me back mm. Mm. to finish that school. How old were you then? Before I started the school. Yeah. For that, it will be like 16 years to 17 years. So that is uh, part, uh, part of that uh, hotline documentary. Kwete Nate did that investigative piece on the telephone line now with me. Hello, Kwete. Hello, Gifty. Kwete, what more can we know about this story? I mean, we've just played the interview you had with one of uh, what the, the elderly uh, guy who has been through it and has grown through it. But what, what more can you tell us? I mean, about much younger ones, children who are engaged in this. Uh, practice or who are forced to be engaged in this practice, Kwete? Gifty, essentially, the list of the voter, you know, brings a new discourse to how poverty is driving mothers to give away or sell their own children hmm. to fishermen. And it's no place um, other than the greater Accra region, Ningo Pram Pram to be specific. And it, 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 it sets your mind to wonder. Ningo Pram Pram is in the greater Accra exactly. region, barely an hour's drive from Accra. And you have having mothers who are claiming because they are poor, they are giving their children away for a pittance. I spoke to one mother, for instance, who told me that uh, he gave away two of his children for 700 CD. Another mother of three said uh, because she wasn't able to take care of her three children, um, she has a husband who is not supportive, so she gave away one of her child to, to, to a slave master for a thousand cities. And mm. her point was that it has enabled her to pay, to pay her family debt. But unfortunately, once these children are taken to the Volta Lake, they are, they are made to engage in work that children are not supposed to be, to be, to be doing. For instance, you wake up around 11.30 p.m. and you are made to work on the lake from 11.30 p.m. to 6 a.m. looking for fingerlings um, to, help, to help the fishermen use it for their net. Um, I, spoke to, I spoke to victims, victims of the uh, trade who told me that at least all of them have witnessed a friend dying on the lake because of uh, what's happening. And once you are given away, you are maltreated, you are sometimes beaten, you have no voice, your life is just filled with misery. So mm. it, it, it's quite um, a pathetic scene on the Volta Lake. Right. Before I set out to investigate the story, I was thinking that this is something that the government um, has worked and dealt with. But it's really an eyesore when, 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 when you are taken to the Volta Lake mm. to take a look at what these children are being made to go through. Mm. It's really pathetic. So what, what more should we expect in the entire video? Um, essentially, you are to expect um, live confessions from some of these mothers, telling stories from some of these victims. There was this particular man I spoke to. He told me that he was trapped under the water for about an hour and 30 minutes because a net had, um, his leg had been caught in a neck under the lake, and he thought that he was dead. It was only a miracle that he was saved. Hmm. So uh, there are a lot of things that um, viewers must, must stay tuned on Monday to, right. to watch the documentary. They will watch the documentary. Thank you very much. Kwete Nate did that particular story, and those are some of the pictures uh, from the story there. Uh, we'll watch that video on Monday. This is Hotline. Uh, we are focusing on children who have been sold into slavery, so to speak. Well, many Ghanaians are being paid for below the minimum wage, uh, are being paid below the minimum wage, even though they're working full time. This is according to the latest labor force survey released by the Ghana Statistical Service yesterday. The report also indicates that over 72% of these workers do not have sick or maternity leave and have are not members of any labor union, making them vulnerable to unfair treatment. Joe News interacted 
with some workers on what their personal working conditions are and this is what they had to say. The situation in the country is forcing people to work longer hours without getting the mid maximum yield of the salary they have to order pay. Because of the economic situation, nobody is complaining. Because when you complain and then maybe you lose your job, which other job do you get? So you'll be sticking to it. But I think it's unfair. At least the government should do something about it by increasing their salary. At least so, also that, so that they can also come out with more productivity. Because if they are innovated and then they are pushed a little, I think very soon the labor front will be satisfied and then more people will be happy of their salary and then they can cater for their children in schools and other things. But now it is inadequate. That, that's the truth. It is inadequate. I work as a head of department. My credit hour for a day it is 24 period. And that is to, is the same to, uh, to my colleague who work under me. Each or everyone must work at least 24 credit period for a day. And it starts from 7.30 out to 3, um, 2.30 uh, in the evening. And after that, all work we have done for the day, you have to mark them and enter into accumulated report. Some must be entered into your register, attendance register for children, so that at the end of the term, you accumulate those reports, which you, if we supposed to be submit, submitted to the, the office, the principal of your or administrative office for reference. And at the end of every month, I may say the salary paid to the work I do as a, a teacher, for that matter, a teacher who holds qualification of first degree, second degree, assistant director of education, if I could be paid 1200 as my take home salary, it doesn't take me anywhere. Um, I'm not on salary, I'm working on, uh, based on commission and it is what you make at the end of the month that is what you are being paid for by commission basically for now that is what I'm doing but I've been on salary before and based on this subject matter uh, that is what actually even brought me into the commission work because you spend all the hours out there working and at the end of the day you are not paid, your remuneration uh, is not uh, actually matching what you are putting in at the work site. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has hinted that the Ekufuado government will, in the coming days, roll out the barracks regeneration project to address the accommodation needs of the military under the policy. Old accommodations will be renovated and new ones will be built to accommodate the many military personnel facing accommodation challenges. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia was reviewing officers at the graduation. He was a reviewing officer, beg your pardon, at the graduation ceremony of the special medical intake three at the military academy in Teshi. He also commended the military for the swift manner in which they deployed men to then travel Gambia to maintain peace and rule of law. Another important factor to bear in mind is that the prevailing with the prevailing global environment, security scenarios are shifting and therefore you must prepare yourselves mentally, physically and professionally to meet the evolving challenges. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me now seize this opportunity to address some of the recurrent concerns of the military and other security services. I am reliably informed that accommodation remains a critical challenge for the personnel of the armed forces. It is my government's plan to roll out a comprehensive housing program dubbed the Barracks Regeneration Project to address the accommodation needs of our dependable soldiers. Under this project, old accommodations will be renovated while new ones will be built to accommodate more military personnel.
Thai government will continue to count on the professionalism of the armed forces in the performance of your constitutional role of defending the territorial integrity of our country, as well as the performance of the task both locally and internationally. Distinguished guests, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Military High Command for the prompt manner you responded to the call to deploy a combat team to the Gambia and assist in creating an enabling environment for the effective enforcement of rule of law. You demonstrated your professionalism once more by marshalling the required number of troops and logistics to facilitate the deployment. It is worth mentioning that Ghana will continue to play this, its role in the Committee of Nations by contributing troops to both sub-regional and international bodies in their efforts to promote international peace. My government will therefore provide the armed forces with the necessary logistics to meet their peacekeeping obligations. Today's ceremony is significant as it marks the graduation of specially selected medical personnel who would soon be deployed to serve the health needs of our gallant soldiers and their civilian compatriots. Permit me, therefore, from the very onset to extend my warmest congratulations to the graduating cadets for their outstanding achievement. I also commend the Military High Command for the continuing for continuing with this special package to address the manpower needs of the Medical Corps of the Ghana Armed Forces and in so doing, contributing to the overall health program of the country. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I also want to highly commend the instructors of the Ghana Military Academy for their fortitude in training these officer cadets. In the space of about five months, they have managed to transform these young men and women into professional military officers, ready to contribute their quota towards the defense of our motherland and sub-region at large. A few moments from now, they will join members of the elite officer corps who are charged with the responsibility of providing leadership in addressing the health needs of all military personnel in particular and the public in general. It is my hope that the graduating cadets will live up to these expectations in contributing to the development of our country. The commissioning of these medical personnel today is timely, taking into consideration the manpower needs of the ongoing construction of the new military hospital in Kumasi. The facility is expected to take care of the medical needs of military personnel in the middle and northern sectors of the country. I have no doubt that the addition of these newly commissioned officers, that with the addition of these newly commissioned officers, the Kumasi Military Hospital will have the requisite staff to operate effectively. My government will continue to provide the necessary support to ensure the facility is well resourced to augment the several medical facilities in the country. The hospital in Kumasi will also be designated as an emergency hospital to cater for emergency situations in the northern part of Ghana. To you, the incoming officers, you must remember that the Ghana Armed Forces is a tried and tested institution and symbolizes our national pride and resolve. You are therefore joining an organization you can truly be proud of. As graduating cadets, I urge you to continue to safeguard the image and reputation of the Ghana Armed Forces. This you can do by exhibiting the highest standard of discipline. 
Well, away from that, let's go to uh, Parliament now, where the debate on the 2017 budget is still ongoing. Well, uh, well, well before we go to Parliament, actually, uh, Latif Idrisa has been speaking with the overall best students among the 99 graduates, uh, Captain Bernard Yimbil Teng. I don't have to take that away from him. Let's hear him. It wasn't easy. Very, very difficult. Um, and everything you do on this planet, when you put God first, you are always able to achieve whatever you want to achieve. It has been very, very difficult, um, but with the grace of God, we have been able to pull through. Today, myself and my colleagues are very, very happy, and we want to say thank you to the instructors, the Ghana Military Academy, and for, I mean, taking care of us, seeing us through all this while. It has been very difficult, but by the grace of God, we are here today and we are very happy. Where do you see yourself in the next, say, five years? The next five years? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Um, I, I want to be the best I can be in the, in the, in the service. That's so it is interesting when uh, the MC read out your details, if I should use that word, and the interesting bit was your favorite meal, dog meat. Yes, if you may know, um, I come from the Upper East region of Ghana. And uh, as you may know, it's a delicacy over there. So, I mean... <laughs> so, so can, you, can you go over that for us? What, what, what is your favorite meal? My favorite meal is chuzafi and beto soup. And I also like the dog meat. <laughs> Well, I'm wondering how he's surviving places where dogs are friends and where dogs are pets, etc. Congratulations to him once again. Well, Chief Training Officer uh, of that group also spoke to Latif Fidrisu. The Ghana Military Academy is the only academy we have that trains officers. And the Special Medical Intake course is not, uh, I would say, is not um, a normal course that is run here at the academy. We have two main courses that we run for the regular career course and the short service course. But to be able to fill the vacancies we have in the hospitals, this is one of this is the third special medical intake course that has been run. So 99 of them spanning all spheres or, or all um, medical. all medical fields. We have doctors, specialists, and all that. So all these people have been trained and will be used to be. Um, stuff the medical hospitals that we have so they are only going to be posted to the medical facility yes certainly i mean that is where they, they are well um vexed in but before they go to the medical facilities they'll be sent to other units where they'll be doing what we call regimentation so regimentation for a period of six months then after they'll be sent to the hospitals would you say the academy is equipped enough to continue discharging its core mandate oh certainly the academy is well um, well charged and we are we are ready to discharge all our, our duties world class oh, we are one of the best in africa so i mean we've trained people from all over the world we've trained people but from a lot of countries in africa talk of nigeria uganda uh, togo benin currently with the regular career course that we have we have two cadets from guinea and two cadets from benin oh, okay. so we are, we, we are we are quite um in in terms of africa we're one of the best academies Congratulations to all of them once again. Well, now we can move uh, safely to Parliament, can't we? Well, the debate on the 2017 budget is still ongoing. Government is seeking, of course, to cut down on funding to some statutory uh, to cut down on some statutory funds and to access IGF. Joseph Apoku Gakpo is our parliamentary correspondent. He joins me on the telephone lines now. Hello, Gakpo. Um, Hello, Gifty. What? What are the funds? What specific funds are they seeking? A government. Uh, is government targeting? Okay, so the focus is on the GET fund, uh, which is supposed to be used in funding education, the NHIS fund, which is used for the purpose of funding the National Health Insurance Scheme, mm. the District Assembly Common Fund, which is money which is supposed to go to the various district assemblies, the road fund, which is supposed to be money meant for the construction of roads, and also internally generated funds of all ministries, departments, and agencies and so uh, from institutions like the Kolebu Hospital to the Pandan Hospital to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as 
numerous other organizations, the Registrar General's Department. With them, the idea is that the funds that they generate internally with the new law which is coming into being, portions of that money would have to be given back to the finance ministry so that then government could make use of those for certain specific purposes in terms of its priority areas. And all of this is contained in what is called the EMR Fund Capping and Realignment Bill 2017, which MPs have been debating today for approval. What are the reasons that the finance minister is backing or, or, or is forwarding to back all of these uh, demands? So, well, the, the finance minister has been explaining that um, this capping arrangement, as they describe it, has become necessary due to what he says is the need to remove what he describes as the rigidity when it comes to public expenditure and also uh, helping with the development of the country. Uh, he's been telling Parliament that presently government is left with virtually nothing after taking out, you know, compensation payments to employees and also uh, disbursing money to these EMS funds and also paying interest when it comes to loans that have been taken already. And this situation has resulted in a cycle where governments are able to raise money to undertake the necessary development projects. And so based on that, they would want to cut down on the funding to these particular uh, agencies to allow for the freeing of money to undertake the specific activities. There's a final bit in a document that he submitted to the Finance Committee. The Finance Minister has been noting that the third capping policy is geared towards ensuring that revenue from these earmarked funds beyond the cap level are realigned for use as general budget support mm -hmm. in order to enable the government to prioritize expenditure for each financial year based on the needs of the country and also uh, you know, based on the public priorities as government would identify. Okay, definitely. Uh, I mean, we know what happens in Parliament. The minority, obviously, will be opposed to this. Are they, and if they are, what are their arguments against? They are, although they've indicated that they don't have a choice than to lend support for it. They've been raising a number of concerns. The minority chief of Munda Kamubara indicated that when you look at this new bill that has been brought to Parliament, it covers a number of other legislations that the House has passed. So the uh, law which allows for the you know get fund the setting up of the get fund the law which allowed for the digital assembly common fund the law which allowed for the setting up of the road fund is mm. concerned that this particular bill just lumps up all of those together and makes specific recommendations on cuts to all of these institutions uh, by uh, you know without taking the time to go back to the fundamental issues based on which those specific laws were passed, and so he thinks it's a worrying situation. Um, other members on the minority side have been raising other concerns. Isaac Adongo, who is a member of Parliament Finance Committee, has, for example, been expressing worry that, you know, these are monies that are needed at the very local government level yeah. when they take various infrastructure projects to help with education, to help with health care, and so cutting down on that would affect the provision of all of these services to them. The final bit, uh, Harun Aijidu, who is the minority leader, has been expressing concern that in the end, the, you know, this bill has come to be would not help the development of the country generally, and it would affect efforts to provide resources for development at the local level. That sounds pretty interesting. But what in this case would the majority be saying? Will they just rest on the back of the argument put, ahead, uh, put, uh, put forward by the finance minister, or are they backing him with any other argument? They've been backing him with a number of other arguments. Dr. Anthony Akutose, who is the Minister for Planning, uh, who is actually the Minister for Monitoring, um, has, for example, been indicating that they've observed the situation where when it comes to the internally generated funds by a lot of these agencies, some of the monies are misused and some of them are not used for issues that are of priority. He thinks that with the coming into being of this bill, all of those monies that they really don't need speaking of the various ministries, departments and agencies that generate this money can come to the central government for mm. use on specific uh, activities. Um, Kuku Adiman Menu, who is the Minister for Health, has also been making some contributions to this. He is insisting that this particular scenario is nothing different. He insists that when it comes to the Digital Assembly Common Fund, for example, um, in, in times past there have been situations where They've been cut to them even without any law being passed to support those. Mm. So this is nothing new which is happening. And so they think that this uh, law coming into being would rather help 
rationalize it and put it in the necessary context when it comes to the country's laws and various acts that have been passed by parliament. Okay, Kakwa, before I let you go, uh, three days ago we know what happened in the UK, uh, in the UK Houses of Parliament. Uh, following that, members of parliament have been calling for tightened security uh, here in Ghana. That issue was raised on the floor today. How did it all uh, uh, end? So the member of parliament for Ifutu, Alexander Fenyo Martins, was the first to raise this. Um, he, you know, quoted news with a report about the incident that happened in Westminster to say that this is a lesson that should, uh, you know, come all the way to Ghana for members of parliament here to also learn from. Uh, he made reference to the judiciary and indicated that, as well as he knows, there are more than 500 police people who are providing protection for the judiciary arm. He also indicated that he's aware that for the executive arm as well, a lot more police people are providing protection for those in the executive arm. But this is not the case when it comes to parliament. And he was asking that the Speaker of Parliament as leadership of the House to give some more assurances to members of parliament that their security would be enhanced even in the lives of the terrorist attacks in the UK. The Deputy Majority Leader, Ajwa Safo, responded to that briefly and indicated that efforts to enhance security when it comes to parliament. Some of it started last year in the last parliament, but um, there will be continuing more of that. He made reference to the cafeteria where parliamentarians usually find themselves and indicated that it's worrying that all sorts of people are able to find their way in the which pose security threats to members of parliament and assured that going forward, some measures will be undertaken to enhance security in the house. Okay. Uh I, I'm, I'm interested to know whether or not they are aware of the public uh, uh, concerns that have been raised on the back of that request that they put out there. Did they mm. speak about it? Yes, um, right on the floor, the member of parliament for the North Tong, uh, uh, you know, constituency, Samuel Okutetu Aplakwa, to draw the attention of members to the fact that uh, these issues about security is not something that is limited to parliament alone and that even beyond Parliament, ordinary members of the public are also concerned about the active here. So uh, he, he, he was asking that beyond the, the request for enhanced security in Parliament, there should be enhanced security across the country so that uh, ordinary members of the public don't feel that they are left out there. Mm. Those were some of uh, you know the, the comments that were thrown out there to doubt that particular concern. Uh, and uh, MPs are indicating that they prioritize their security as much as they prioritize that of their constituents and also ordinary members of the public. Thank you so much, Gakpo. Joseph Opoku Gakpo is our parliamentary correspondent. Uh, there will bring you all of the pictures and all of the sound bites and our subsequent bulletins uh, right uh, when Gakpo returns from Parliament. At this point, the process is to get the French embassy relocated from the seat of government. The Flagstaff House starts today. Security concerns about the proximity of the embassy to the Flagstaff House have remained an, uh, has remained an issue since the seat of government was commissioned by former President Kufo in 2008. President Kufuado has cut sword for the construction of the new French embassy at Cantonment to start the relocation process. It is an enriching experience and a moment of considerable joy to witness this occasion as it will be recalled the negotiations for the relocation of the French Embassy have been saddled with mixed feelings and a certain undue amount of anxieties. Change can be uncomfortable. However, this change from the old site to the current location has occurred within manageable limits. And I'm glad to see that the design of the new building seems to have been inspired by that of the old. I'm confident that the edifice of the new Chancellor Building would be the foundation stone and continuation of the growing interest of France in Ghana's development and progress. Our country continues to benefit from French support in sectors such as health, rural water supply, agriculture, construction, telecommunication, and industry for which we are grateful. In recent times, Ghana and France have increased collaboration in security matters for the maintenance of peace and security through technical exchanges with the military and police service. France agreed to support the African Union 
in the development of its collective security system, particularly the African Standby Force, and pledged financial support as well as offered to train 15,000 African troops for peacekeeping. In May 2014, the Ghana-France Chamber of Commerce was outdoored in Accra as one of the initiatives of the economic development between our two countries. It carried into being the work of the Club Lutes, which was the original symbol of the springboard of the chamber, in which I was one of its initial sponsors. Only last month in February, Air France commenced its flights between Paris and Accra. This brings to record 170 French projects in Ghana with services as the leading sector. This growing interest among French companies in Ghana is welcome. And I want to say that Ghana recognizes the importance of the security of such investments and will ensure that our relevant institutions stand ready to protect them. It is gratifying to note that the aim of the mission is to complete the construction within a period of 18 months. I trust that those given the onerous responsibility of constructing this new building will deliver efficient and timely work so that its opening would help to expand the already cordial relations between Ghana and France.